So what a pleasure to be here with you today talking about one of my favorite subjects, and that is the challenge that we have ahead uh, as employers to really change the game, to transform what we think is a, a critical um, trend uh, amongst all of our employees, certainly at Cisco. Uh, what I've been asked to do is pretty much share a case study with you, so I'd like to set the context a bit by um, first saying that a lot of employers are getting in to the business of healthcare. Uh, for some of my colleagues, I come from a, a background of hospital administration, this feels like a bit of a threat, like why are they getting in on our space? Uh, we try to have to say at Cisco to collaborate with a number of our local providers and because of some reimbursement challenges it was really hard for them to react and to do the kinds of things at the depth we wanted. So we thought we'd experiment with our own and see uh, what we could do in trying to, to bend that cost curve and change perhaps the behavior of, of our employees. Uh, what we find though is that about a hundred um, of our other colleagues in terms of large companies are doing the same thing. Uh, right now you see corporate clinics uh, sort of popping up everywhere with a lot of, a lot of the Fortune 500 companies. Uh, they have different flavors though. Some are wellness and prevention and really focus on that. Intel is a great example. They have small centers in a number of their campuses. Um, others are occupational health and workers comp related, trying to take care of that first injury and manage the employee back to work. Um, others are urgent care lookalikes. In other words, come by here when you have a problem rather than going to the ER and urgent care center. And then others really do delve into more of primary care. When we took a look at our population, uh, this told us that we had to take a unique approach. Uh, we have a, a population that's quite large. We have about 70,000 employees. 18,000 of those are in our corporate office in San Jose. Uh, we wanted to start with some sort of a presence there because we saw the cost increasing, especially in that population and, and our claims. Uh, we have a 93% retention rate, and this is really key when we talk about what is, is um, possible in terms of transforming uh, at least the, the cost and also the care model. Uh, if you have employees who are with you for a long time, obviously you can see the result of that, and you can determine whether what you're doing is working. So we're lucky enough right now to have a 93% uh, retention rate. That's held for almost the life of the company, at least for the past 10 years. Um, we also have an average age of 41. Uh, this changes a lot in, in anything you know about Cisco. You know that we do a lot of acquisitions, so it sort of bubbles up and down based on who we've acquired recently. Uh, but when I started with the company, it was 36 years old. Uh, I always say that I didn't change that alone. That was not the, the sort of the factor that changed things, but it has been moving up a bit with some of our acquisitions. The other things with our retention rate, of course, we're, go we're gonna move up that stream. What that tells us though, when we take a look at all of our uh, population trends is that unless we help our employees become healthier than they are right now, and we do health risk assessments uh, frequently, once a year, uh, so we know at least where they are from their own self-reported perspective, then we are going to see an increase in our, our benefit costs and certainly a decline in their health status. And, and I have to say here that it's not on the chart, but one of the things that we are really concerned about is not just the cost of Cisco, we're really concerned about our employees' ability to innovate. Uh, we believe that's the differentiator for us, having the best and the brightest and having them push uh, in every industry, including healthcare, uh, to figure what the internet solutions can bring uh, to the way we live and work and play. Uh, and without that innovation, then we're not going to get to where we want to go as a sustainable company. So for us, that's a greater value proposition. They're all connected uh, by internet tools. Uh, we laugh and say they're all wired because from both perspectives, that's true, okay? They use the internet for everything and if they can't use it for everything, Thing, then they're disappointed and they give us a lot of feedback about, you know, this just doesn't work, we need to fix it. They oftentimes will suggest ways in which we might fix it as well. Um, most employees are also shareholders. What that means is that they care about the company and they care about what we do, how we spend our money, how successful we are. So they're motivated by that culture. Now I give you that background just so you understand some of the decisions that we've made and some of the sort of results that we see. We envisioned a healthcare center on our campus in San Jose in 2006 and began to sort of draft plans for that. Um, the idea, again, was to try to prevent that oncoming um, sort of de decline in health status and potentially increase in cost. Uh, and, and we also wanted to enhance employee productivity. Now, I say this is this is our, our plan in 2006. 
Um, certainly we wanted to emphasize prevention, wellness, those sorts of things, but we also wanted that presence and that engagement uh, for our employees in terms of a center there. Um, we had already gotten per our, our permission to move forward. We'd gotten funding for the health center, and we thought we were well on our way when we decided we'd really put a fine point on our design and talk to our employees about what they wanted, uh, what they thought was key to make them actually use the center. Um, this was our first wrinkle. There were many wrinkles along the way, and I, and I, I will tell you everything that I can in the first uh, you know, 10 minutes about what we learned along this path as we, we grew our uh, vision. Uh, they told us they didn't need a health center on campus. Um, so we said, okay, what we're trying to determine is what you'd like in one, and with the way we don't need one. You know, we've got Palo Alto Medical Foundation, we've got Stanford right around the corner, we don't really need a health center. So I get this really urgent call from the person who was coordinating the focus groups for us and said, you know, Houston, we have a problem because they don't even want a center, so we can't get past that. So we quickly had to reframe with all of our questions, okay, if you had a center on this campus, what would make you use it? Right? Now, that sounds like a simple thing, but because of, of business reasons and concerns about what we saw coming forward, uh, we knew we wanted one, we were building, we had the money, like good corporate citizens, we're going to build it, because we now have permission, right? So we're going to do it. Uh, how can we make them use it? What we found was something really important, and that is they felt they could get good care in terms of primary care when they had a need. Now, their reason for, or the way our mechanism they were using was drop by the emergency room on the home, way home on Friday, or go to an urgent care center, one of those kinds of things. That was their most frequent way of getting care. And we knew that lacked continuity and really was not the experience that we wanted. So the vision sort of grew. We had to learn from them what would make them come to the center. Now, this was a surprise to us, and, and I have to say to our medical director as well, um, because what we learned is that they wanted an expanded list of services. They wanted a center that did not look like a Cisco building. They wanted something that was a healing environment. They didn't say spa, but all the words that they said said spa, okay. They wanted a place that was a respite, if you will, from their normal work life, because they live in Cubeville, right? Dilbert is, is, a, is a consultant with us, because you know what? We probably give him a lot of material. I mean, that's the environment that we're in. Um, so what they said was that we want acupuncture services, we want chiropractic services, we want sort of assistance with our travel medicine. A lot of them travel. They have no idea what they're supposed to get in the way of, of you know, travel advice or vaccines or any sort of planning there. Um, that's what we want, but we also want that connected to that primary care experience. And guess what? We want our doctors and clinicians like acupuncturists to talk to each other, right? We want to be the center of the university. We want this little crew of people to help coach us through any process. So with that in mind, and with a lot of sort of arm twisting about we really want to have acupuncturists and chiropractors on our, um, on our campus, we began to develop what is now the Life Connection Center. We reframed a lot of things. We started out with being an on-site clinic. Um, we talked about it being a medical center. Uh, again, if people are in their 40s, they're not really that excited about going to a clinic or thinking about it, right? So we had to reframe the whole thing. Um, we also found that we had a, sh a vast shortage of space for our um, child care center uh, uh, enrollees. We had about 400 Cisco kids already on campus and already always had a waiting list. And we're advertising, of course, that we have that benefit. Uh, and that's a great thing for, for young parents. So we added another child care center. And then we shut down all the um, fitness centers we had on campus. Now this was difficult and the employees were really fussing about this because we had what I would call this sort of Marriott Courtyard version of a fitness center sort of sprinkled across our 80 acres, right? Just a few treadmills here and there and it was pretty, you know, pretty drab. Nothing you'd really want to go to and certainly nothing you could do group kind of sessions in. So even though they were aggravated, we shut them all down and we created in this same space, and this was a critical thing, a, a fitness center. Now our thinking here was that the continuum of care, if we're talking about really trying to have a healthy population, it is it's pretty much a continuum that's broader. And that is it contain, contains fitness, it contains health services of all sorts of uh, uh, types, including coaching and, and the other things that we talked about. It also includes those services that in, include your family and get them involved in the health experience. So the Life Connection Center was born. We stopped calling them patients, started calling them employees or individuals. Very simple, okay, but not patients. Uh, we have about 118,000 square feet that contain all of those services. We also found that 
um, we have a great commitment at, at Cisco to sort of making the world a better place. And I, in particular, have a, a vision and a passion around green. So we're one of the first uh, Cisco buildings, in fact, the first Cisco building that was LEED certified. Um, that was a, a design challenge, but one I would encourage you to always look at. So we also wanted to tra transfer the patient experience, not only through the facility design, meaning the physical space, but through the design of the experience and using technology in a way that um, made it sort of seamless, but also what we call frictionless. The parts of the process that they didn't like, the check-in, the check-out, the waiting, the HIPAA forms, all that sort of thing we do online and we do automatically. Uh, we have a three minute wait time when they come into the clinic and that's only because it takes a few minutes for them to get to the care suite. All the care suites are actually suites, which are a living room along with a, um, a exam room and then a private bathroom. And for, for lots of reasons we had to make that choice and that has proved to be a good selection. We also deliver a lot of online services. They do register check-in and, and use secure messaging to communicate with their physician. Uh, as I mentioned, we have a long list of the things that um, they have. We have a, a pediatrician now who came on board after the first year. By the way, we've been open two years, in case you're wondering about that. It took us about 18 months to, to actually transform the building that we have. We took a, a, an existing space that we were leasing and actually uh, revamped that for the space. We do primary care pediatrics. Uh, we have full service laboratory that are, are clear waved ones. We have a full service pharmacy. We've added digital x-ray. Uh, one of the things that's unusual here too is that we have our own physicians. We have seven physicians right now along with the pediatrician. We also carved out space because about 9% of our employees are Kaiser members and so we also have a suite that serves those Kaiser populations. So we're running double medical records. We're, we're doing a lot of things with technology that you couldn't do in a normal sort of environment. We also have just added vision care and provide that sort of full service there. The most popular thing that we do is health coaching. Our employees really like to have that one-on-one -on -one conversation. Uh, and whether it's something around uh, quitting smoking or uh, weight loss, they seem to really like that connection, uh, not only with the physician when they need it, but also with a life coach. And this isn't not, not a fitness coach, but it, actually a life coach. In terms of value proposition, we looked at the traditional ROI, um, medical savings, how much is our benefit cost going to go up or down. Um, certainly patient satisfaction was part of it, pharmacy services in terms of lowering cost and trying to push generics uh, where appropriate. And also we wanted to use the space as a learning lab. And sort of here is what we realized over time though, and that is we really um, asked the wrong questions our first year. We, we did, I think, like a, a lot of people do, and that is we try to gauge success based on patient satisfaction or the financial return on investment. Uh, what we found is that we reached those marks. We did a really good job in terms of reducing ER visits. Uh, we uh, are comparing favorably to our community when it comes to use of diagno diagnostic testing or generics. Um, the medical cost avoidance is about a million dollars so far, a year into this when we have calculated that, and drug savings are about $450,000. Uh, that's not bad for, uh, for the first year. Uh, many don't turn the corner, and I certainly probably won't do that for about three or four years in terms of paying for itself. But we think that's a good start. But for us, you know, the value is really not around that financial ROI. As I mentioned earlier, innovation is the key with us. Having a healthy population and happy population is critical. Having them feel a part of the Cisco family and wanting to stay with us uh, is far more valuable. So in our latest um, sort of iteration of how we do um, our surveys to employees, we ask them different questions. Uh, and this is, I think, the greatest learning for us. And that is, we wanted to know, did had this experience at Life Connections help improve my health status. Uh, we're happy that 72% said yes uh, to that between January and May. Uh, we want it to be 100%, but right now it's about 72%. Uh, I'm really thrilled that 95% said it did help them manage their health and integrate those services. Remember they said we want not only services that are unique, but we also want those things that are integrated. And I want to have my clinicians talking to each other. This tells me we're getting close to that, and it's a constant challenge. Uh, and also 73% said that it helped me feel a part of that family and important uh, Ms. Cisco's mind. So sort of in summary, what we've learned so far, uh, information, education, and awareness is um, helpful, but it's certainly not enough. What we're finding is that emotional connection is really critical. We have one um, of our senior executives right now who is frankly losing his battle with prostate cancer. 
He has um, told us he wants to come forward and share his story in hopes of getting our population, which is about 75% male, more um, aware of early um, diagnosis and treatment. Um, that is making at that compelling event, because he is a popular and also senior executive, uh, a much more of an impact than anybody trying to educate or knowledge share, right? And that leadership and that, that um, ability of, of his, I think, effort to make that known and to share that openly is a critical um, uh, point and certainly does raise awareness uh, and make a difference in their behavior. Uh, also leveraging culture and leaders' influence. We find that our um, employees will do what their managers ask them to do and also what they model in terms of behavior. Seems like a simple thing, but boy, does this translate in healthcare. If they see that a manager values health, uh, uses the fitness center, goes to the, the events, uh, is really focusing on that as part of the culture, then they seem to react positively. Again, it sounds simple, but it seems more effective than some of the educational strategies we've used in the past. Also engaging uh, employees and families is key. We're, we are, um, I have to tell you, more and more using children. Uh, we have a real family structure in terms of our culture at Cisco, and we can, if we can get the kids to sort of, you know, nudge the, the parents, then we make a lot of progress that way. Uh, we've had SpongeBob, bear, uh, SpongeBob SquarePants to come in and visit at the clinic and to visit with the kids at the child care center. And you know what, when we talk about health and nutrition, they sort of then elbow their parents. And so we're continuing to use that. We figure if we've got the kids, we'll use them, right? Um, also hiring physicians who promote themselves um, is a challenge, I have to say. Many, many physicians are used to treating patients right, and an episodic care, and they like to, to have an ongoing relationship, but they're not that used to maybe doing the self-promotion and really getting out to encourage somebody to come in so that they can, can have a, a relationship with them. So we are really struggling to make sure that we have the right physicians who can do that and feel comfortable doing that. Um, and also, it's health, not health care. Uh, and it's individuals, not patients. And those have been critical learnings for us as well. So the questions to ponder then in this environment, I think, come down to, is this corporate center a passing fad, not just ours, but the whole trend? Um, or is it a sustainable model? Secondly, are, are corporations just replicating, and this is my fear coming from hospital administration, uh, the problems that exist in our current system of healthcare, or are we providing something that's more creative and more, uh, more interesting? And also, does this, since we're talking about a community of people, translate in any other way to communities uh, across the globe, and can that be used in any other way? So thank you for letting us be a part of this. It's been a pleasure. <laughs>